welcome you all to this third talk in the City Talk series. Um, it's an initiative of the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects in partnership with Hobart City Council. And to get us started, I'd like to introduce the Lord Mayor of Hobart, Alderman David Thomas. Thanks very much and uh, welcome everybody and thanks for inviting us to be involved. Um, uh, firstly, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to acknowledge formally that today we're meeting on the land for which the Nuwanina um, Aboriginal people have been uh, custodians for many centuries, on which age old uh, ceremonies have been performed and who have, of course, a continuing association with the land. Um, it's my role just to do that standard ministerial stand up and make the speech and grace the way, but in this case, we'll just pause for a bit longer. Um, and of course, the role for us is simply to open uh, the third seminar in the City Talk series. The Australian Institute of Landscape Architects, in conjunction with the partners of the City of Hobart, have organised these events, and their aim is to demonstrate Tasmanian local government leadership and commitment to quality urban design, to foster the existing culture of art and design in Tasmania, especially Greater Hobart, and to foster partnerships between Tasport, State, and local government and key stakeholders in achieving urban design excellence. To publicise a greater understanding of urban design, its multidisciplinary nature, and particularly the role of landscape architects within its practice, and to bring an array of inspiring speakers from around Australia to stimulate debate and partnership in urban design projects. I just want to start off with a, the, the basic fundamentals of what the structure is around this waterfront. How many people here are from Hobart? Well, the great majority of you can now uh, turn off for a moment. So I'm, just <laughs> indicate, I'm just going to indicate that um, the port area of Hobart has effectively been um, at, on obviously of which Salamanca and Constitution Dock and this area is all part of, has traditionally been um, a people place, a place for people to congregate. Uh, it used to be the place in the, in the 50s and early 60s where you bought your uh, your little scallop bucket down, and you were able to buy scallops off the fishermen for 50 cents, or whatever it was at that time, um, off the docks, take them home, and, and you felt an affinity to the waterfront. It was also a place where, um, for every time a cruise ship came in, um, you were able to go down, you could touch the ship from the side of the dock. There was nothing called security at that point. And I well remember my uh, father and mother having gone on board many a passenger ship pretending to be passengers and have a nice lunch on board, uh, courtesy of P or P and O. I think in later years they did cruise, so they probably paid back for it. But the reality was it was a place of the people. And over the last uh, uh, few years, probably even just before 9-11, uh, uh, we started to see our harbour shut off. We started to see our waterfront closed off to the people and the uh, traditional sh uh, fishing off wharves uh, stopped um, and we found also with the um, uh, move from uh, the Hobart uh, Ports Corporation or the old Hobart Marine Board into a Task Ports Corporation. Have we got anybody from Task Ports here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we found that um, with the uh, absorption of Hobart Port into a wider ports network, that the board of Task Ports uh, effectively. Um, concentrated on its own business and, and didn't potentially to the degree that a lot of us would have liked engage as much with the local community about this port which of course was precious this port and the surroundings um, and became very heavily involved with the freight operation involved with the freight operation from the north of the state principally moving freight from here by the rail system uh, from Macquarie Point out to through Brighton up to the north. So this became very much um, a port that was too far away for economical sailing, for a freight, and all of the freight uh, capacity started to be taken out from the north and northwest. Uh, Burnie was significantly upgraded, and we found ourselves in a situation that until the continual advent of the cruise ship passengers, we didn't see a lot of shipping here at all. We had the uh, Antarctic involved in the Antarctic engagement for the Aurora and the French uh, polar uh, presence. But effectively, until we're starting to see some of 38 to 40 cruise ships here a year, with over 100,000 passengers, 
I think, personally, my personal belief, not that necessarily of the City of Hobart, is that we started to lose uh, very much an engagement with the Port Authority. Now, when you look at the, the Port at the present time, the scenario quite clearly is that we have a receding, diminishing industrial presence. The uh, opening of the Brighton Rail Hub will mean that all freight, all intermodal freight, will move from Brighton, and very little will actually happen on this waterfront. Uh, there was even a potential at the spur line into Macquarie Point at the far end uh, was going to be abandoned, and we would end up with no, no rail line from here um, to the Rail Hub at Brighton. And that has probably reverse back up a bit with uh, Tasrail indicating that line will stay open. The question is who's going to maintain it. So with potentially the advent or promotion of, of the light rail option, uh, that rail line will need to be uh, in a condition sufficient. So if that does develop, we can actually take advantage of it. What we have now though is a large amount of activity by individual developers on the waterfront. We have the IMAS development which is occurring course over um, in front of, uh, behind uh, Princess Wharf number one, which is a significant undertaking for the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies. It's half constructed already and will be a world institution. Uh, there was controversy about where it was placed, but the reality is it's there. On top of that, we have um, further developments. For those on the left-hand side of the plane, you can look out the window, really, <laughs> and you'll see um, the two buildings, first of all the one with the red and white sign on the side of it, that is currently being evaluated for a major uh, upgrade by private developers in conjunction with transports as a reta as a public space and potentially accommodation above at a $26 million fit. Behind that is the cruise ship terminal, having now removed its asbestos roof, it's now moving towards having a new $8.3 million purpose built uh, place to receive the cruise ship passengers. On this side, on the other side, of course, we have uh, the publicly announced Brook Street Pier development, which will be a uh, pier um, on pylons <coughs> attached only basically to the Franklin Wharf, uh, and it will take a lot more ferry passengers. Now, ferry passengers being vital if we're going to stop using um, the bridge to the degree we are. Infrastructure-wise, we need to relive this part of the port uh, through a much more expanded use of a ferry terminal. At the moment, the terminal is being used, such as it is, for over 300,000 people a year going to Mona. So Mona caught up, unsurprising, uh, came up uh, without notice, really, uh, in terms of the demand that a very small old passenger pier is now using um, for a wide-scale operation three or four times a day, lifting up to 100 people at that time. Next to that, there is a proposal um, to do a radical refit Murray Street Pier. Now, in the context of what we're talking about, um, there doesn't appear to be, uh, as a landowner, an, an appropriate commercial set of criteria for what's happening, even with the things I'm talking about. So you actually have seven or eight individual developments which the council as a planning administrator now i'll go through some of these materials in a short in a minute we're doing it in in uh, without a real knowledge of what the ports corporation's intentions are for commercial development of the code so i just wanted to overlay that because we have probably with the rail yards redevelopment as well which is a major uh, uh, development on the other side involving something like that nine hectares, we have probably the greatest potential other than, you know, Bangaroo and, and other areas uh, of all of Australia, and yet we probably need to put a few bits of ink on the book in terms of some of the structure before we can continue to deal with piecemeal without a coordinated approach. Um, so talking, just going back very briefly uh, to the material, um, next year will be a, a fairly a busy year around Sullivan's Cove. We have uh, a, a range of things happening. First of all, we have the Taste Festival, which is, is obviously on every year. It's a nine, uh, seven day event, Ron. I should acknowledge the Deputy Lord Mayor, Ron Christie, in the audience today. Um, we have a seven day major Taste Festival, which has what, 200, 300,000 people coming through. So that takes the first 
adjunct. And after that, next year we have the Wooden Boat Festival. We have the uh, 10 days on the island, which partly uses this area. Um, and during the year, we will be having Mona in the Dark, which is a $4 million major winter festival. Now all of that, and then we have a tall ships race in September from Sydney. All that's gonna be happening at the same time as the developers that I've talked about will be starting to be developed. And when we're talking about things like the Brook Street Pier, we're talking about a peer development that will potentially help save 100 odd jobs up at the shipyard where they're gonna build it. Now the, um, the council of course now has uh, the responsibility is planning authority for the Sullivan's Cove planning scheme. And this we believe will ensure a much better integration between the planning for this area and the city proper. When we had two planning authorities for a brief spate of a few years, effectively what we did on the other side of the road didn't necessarily in any way uh, connect with what was happening here, either in road systems, in parking, in traffic requirements, uh, even in building dimensions. So we were very pleased to see that integration return um, when the planning uh, jurisdiction was given back to us. So the city has engaged landscape architect, inspiring place to undertake a master plan of the Queen's domain uh, that has broad reaching recommendations about the waterfront at the point of the regatta grounds, which is over the hill and to the left. The so Macquarie Wharf number one and two I've mentioned, Brook Street Pier and IMAS. Uh, we also have the remediation of the rail yards, which is currently being handled by the state government, $50 million provided by the federal government. The inner city development plan has some key projects linked to the waterfront. The Castro Esplanade pedestrian and cycleway, the improvements to Lower Elizabeth Street that will facilitate a clear connection from the central business district to Sullivan's Cove. The city has recently joined with the Department of Infrastructure uh, to lodge a bid for significant funding to facilitate a multi-purpose pedestrian and bike track that will travel around our waterfront to link the University of Tasmania Sandy Bay campus with the Queen's Domain campus. The city has been trialling ways of widening the footpath at Salamanca Place to provide greater space for walking and dining. And we're really pleased with an ice skating rink starting here on the 22nd of December, just along the road here next to the waterfront pavilion. All of these projects will become catalysts, we believe, for greater change. The city is committed to facilitating this change by ongoing partnership with task boards and we will work with them to see what their intentions are. Uh, and along with developers in projects that respond to both our planning scheme and the Sullivan's Code Master Plan. The city will implement real urban design projects on the ground in Sullivan's Code, starting with the various inner city action projects, uh, which uh, the architect, Danish architect, girl associates uh, have briefed us on, and we'll be starting those as early as the start of next year. Um, we, will, we will now be inspired, this is you as the audience, by three landscape architects who will talk about your, their experiences in the design and implementation of successful waterfront projects. I hope as I introduce the first one, I, I hope I haven't muddied the water, I'll just try to provide a picture, picture postcard of what we're looking at at the moment. Fantastic change, fantastic opportunity, uh, I think if we don't get it right by putting some of these ground rules, <coughs> we can make an absolute right mess of it along the way for the future generations. I'd now I'd like to invite Jerry de Grease, Landscape Architect and Director of Inspiring Place, to give a short introduction. Thank you. I think I also mentioned that uh, Rob and I have been uh, promoting and pushing with Tim and other people in council a new prospectus for the city, which obviously includes this area, so I'm very much left with that, folks. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, welcome, everybody, distinguished guests, um, friends, colleagues, fellow professionals, uh, to this third third talk in the City Talks. Um, I'd just like to begin by uh, mentioning the major sponsors, Great Tasmania and Lapset. It's always good to have uh, the support of the industry that's behind landscape architecture in the promotion of the profession. And uh, what I want to do be in before introducing the, the two uh, keynote speakers today is I wanted to pick up on one of the objectives of these talks, which was to highlight to the community the role of landscape architects in the development of our place, and our place in the uh, in the, in the city and in, in, in the landscape generally. Um, it's 
You know, I think landscape architecture as a profession has uh, been in search of a soundbite all its life. You know, we don't have a, a one sentence definition of what we do as a profession. And it's partly, it partly arises from the fact that it's a complex profession, and I want to just explain a little bit of that complexity. But one uh, good sort of soundbite uh, definition that, that I liked as a student anyway at the, at the University of Melbourne was Michael McCarthy said that landscape architecture was stewardship of the land by the design by design. Now, I like that because, A, I like the idea of stewardship. I like the notion of caring for the environment. I was a passionate and, uh, environmentalist as a youth and still am. Uh, I like the idea that it talked about the land. I'm a terra-centric person. I don't like to get wet, necessarily. Uh, and I like the idea of design because, uh, you know, it's an engaged and creative process. But I think it does have its limitations, like everything. I think for the general community, Stewardship has three syllables, that might be too many, don't know, but uh, you know, it's important to think, think it through. A simpler way, that, and one that I've been sort of tossing around, and, and it's probably still not very good, is to talk about it as the planning and design of the life outside of buildings. Architects capture the space of buildings quite well and do that well, but we look at everything in between, everything around it, and everything beyond it. And I think that's, that's the, the gives a sense of, uh, some sense of the profession, but and when we, if we use either of those definitions or any other definition, we can start to talk then about the breadth of the profession. We can talk about the spectrum of activity that we're engaged in. Uh, as professionals, we engage in everything from policy development at a very high level across the whole of the state through to the detail, nuts and bolts, how to put a chair together, how to put a seat together in the landscape. So it's a, it's a broad spectrum of activity. We work across a sense of scale. I have a colleague, a friend of mine from university, who is on a committee that looks after the entire Arctic Circle as a sense of scale. Now that's, and she's a landscape architect, uh, where some of us might work in terms of square meters uh, of space. So the scale of our profession is quite broad. The span of our profession geographically is broad. I think as landscape architects, we work right across the entire continent. We cross, work across regions, we work across, um, you know, the whole geography of the planet, really. Uh, we work in different settings. Our profession ranges in its activity from looking after wilderness through to looking after critical, highly developed, highly articulated urban space. So the, the, the setting that we get to work in is, is quite, uh, quite incredible. We also think of our, you can think of some of our professionals in terms of the style of the way they work. We have some... Uh, some landscape architects will work at a very artistic, almost uh, gallery level of uh, design about uh, what, they're, what they're designing in the landscape. And others work at a very scientific, very rigorous, very quantitative end of the profession uh, as, as well. So there's, there's different ways of looking at the style of how they work. The scope of our profession is also very broad. We, we engage you know, across horticulture, structural engineering, electrical engineering, uh, architecture. We, we engage with in a whole range of professions butt up against and interact and intersect with what we do as professionals. Uh, we also can describe ourselves in terms of the specialist solutions that we engage in. Uh, there are expert landscape architects in brownfield remediation or in the redevelopment of industrial sites. There's greenfield specialists, there's recreation planner, planning specialists. So there's a whole range of specialist solutions. And I think importantly there's also the synergistic relationships that we work with as a profession. We're not, I don't think as a whole, we're, the, we're an egotistical profession, and I think we build synergies with communities and with people in looking at their places. It's quite unique to our profession uh, in, the way, in the way we work. So there's a whole range of uh, ways of analyzing and looking at our profession, and I haven't once mentioned parks or gardens, which is where a lot of people who define the profession say, Oh, we designed everything from the backyard to a national park. I haven't mentioned the sites yet that we work on, and that sort of brings us around to today, because we do do everything from parks to national parks. We do, but we also do everything from the city to uh, to the a piazza, to a plaza, to a mall, and some in one area. And the focus of today is, is the waterfront. The sites is a waterfront. Now, I just want to say that in thinking about those sites and looking uh, for some examples and thinking examples and thinking about things to, for today. 
I realized that landscape architects, as a profession, actually own the waterfront. We, we own it as a site where we work, and you just have to look around the world to see the work of landscape architecture on the world stage, in the great cities of the world, in the minor cities of the world, where landscape architects have really brought home the opportunity that the waterfront presents to be a lived-in, loved, and cultured space. This is a, uh, that was a, sorry, that's a net, that's a designed beach in Seattle, by the way. So, all of these are landscape architecture <coughs> design spaces. They're, they do engage with, uh, in this case, with architects, so that it's not a singular that we work by ourselves, but we work in collaboration with a range of people. But again, these are all arch landscape architect-led projects, and I'm keeping uh, Tony and Sasha's powder dry here by not showing you any of their work. I love this one in Toronto. Um, and it's not just in Australia, in, uh, in Europe, Australians are involved, Taylor Colley Lentley, an Australian firm working in New Zealand in this case. Uh, New Zealand again, Sarah Ray uh, sends her apologies for today. Unfortunately, she was meant to be here to present some of her work. And you can just keep going. And you can keep going, and you can keep going. And eventually you get here. And our landscape architects in Hobart have done good work on our work, but they there to be congratulated. But it brings me to this slide. It says, how come so little of our waterfront has actually been articulated and designed and cared for in a, in, a, in a higher level than it has been? And you could say, you could say, well, maybe we've suffered from analysis paralysis. We've done too many reports and just haven't got on with the job. Maybe it's this intergovernmental warfare that sort of articulates around our waterfront between different organizations with responsibility. Maybe it's, we can blame it on professionals that we haven't done enough, we haven't done well enough in explaining our capacities and our skills and the outcomes we want from the waterfront. We can, we can talk the blame game for a long time, and maybe we do that over a beer, and I don't want to do that uh, for very long. I want to now say there's tremendous opportunity and there's tremendous reasons to be excited, continue to be excited about our waterfront. Some of us have put up plans since the early 80s for the waterfront that if they had been implemented, you know, the waterfront would be different today. Again, for whatever reason it hasn't. But the opportunity is still there. The excitement is still there. The potential is still there. It is an untapped uh, potential that can be unleashed. And what I want to do today is to invite and uh, introduce you to two people that have worked around Australia and overseas to develop waterfronts that are quite exciting. And the, the, the first uh, on the agenda today is Sasha. Sasha. Uh, Sasha Coles. I said Sasha Cohen at home the other night. My, my daughter said, you mean he's going to talk about his accuracy? <laughs> so, uh, but it's, it is, it's Sasha Coles. Sasha is a director of Aspect Studios. Uh, Aspect have offices in Sydney and in Melbourne, like, as I know it. Sasha himself has been involved in planning and design of a number of award-winning uh, public landscapes. We wouldn't show, introduce you to anybody who hasn't won awards. So Sasha and Tony are both award-winning landscape architects. Uh, in particular, Sasha is the winner of the International Federation of Landscape Architects Professional Award uh, medal, and he's written and lectured widely about um, Aspect's work. I would say that the little bit I know about uh, Sasha's about Aspect is I've always been impressed with the, uh, the great depth of rigor and understanding that you guys put into everything before you put it on the table. I've seen a number of your reports, and, and I've got a high regard for the considered way that Sasha's firm approaches the projects that they do, and I'd like to invite you to welcome Sasha Falls to the table. Uh, thank you very much, Jerry, for a uh, generous introduction, and uh, of course I'd like to say thank you to the Lord Mayor, councillors, um, everyone else in attendance, and thank you to Ayla, most importantly, for having us here today. I'm just going to shift to my presentation, which will be... Uh, I'm just sitting here listening to the introductory talk, so I can say that I empathise very strongly with um, a lot that's been said, whether it's about uh, governance, uh, whether it's about, I think Jerry talked about a kind of a, a blame game and a, a, um, you know, maybe being slightly responsible for things not happening. Um, but I can see clearly from your Lord Mayor's uh, passion about what's happening around here that there's 
uh, very much uh, an interest on what happens as a people place for your waterfront. And I think there are some parallels with Sydney. My talk today is going to be really focusing on Sydney primarily through a range of projects, some of which have been our projects, um, some others. And I'll briefly touch on the sort of the context in which we practice and where we've come from as a profession as well. I'll show you one project that's not in Sydney um, later on. But just to set the context, um, really this is the area that I'll focus on today and um, for many of you who probably know Sydney, it's again a lot of parallels with this place here, um, a, a harbour city, um, in this case a, you know, a, very, um, a very, I suppose, iconic harbour city, drowned river valley, sandstone headlands, forging down to, uh, to the water. Most of the projects that you'll see today are really around this sort of inner ring of the harbour um, down through here and I'll take you through um, maybe four or five of those projects. But I just wanted to start by saying what we've seen in Sydney in the last 10 years I think is the next step um, and it's been a result of a range of things but the next step in terms of the transformation of our harbour front and really we're probably, a lot of you who would know Sydney's landscape would also know that the 70s were a very vital time for us in Sydney in terms of the establishment of a, a school, if you like, a practice of landscape architecture, a kind of a, an ecological reclaiming of public space on the waterfront. And I'm talking about people like Bruce McKenzie and Harry Howard and Bruce Rickard and, uh, and others who um, really were seminal in terms of landscape architecture in Australia and their practice was here on the harbour foreshore of Sydney. And we still carry that legacy um, through today in terms of contemporary practice um, and, and indeed they're, they're really our, our teachers in a number of ways. Um, what I'd like to show you in, in this slide here is um, really this, this red line which absolutely everybody has got behind in Sydney I would say from federal to state to local government um, and this red line that knits the sort of the western edge um, and then up around to the east, so basically from our Botanic Gardens down through to Glebe and um, the Bays Precinct, which is here in blue, is a 14 kilometre um, soon to be connected harbour foreshore park. And it goes through a range of different cultural landscapes, post industrial landscapes, uh, parks, um, and there are a range of key projects that have actually filled in the gaps along this 14 kilometre walk. The reason I'm talking about it is it's a very easy thing to have in your brain to, um, to advocate. Um, everyone talks about the 14 kilometre walk, whether it's uh, the Lord Mayor of Sydney, who is a passionate advocate of public space and waterfront, or whether it's state government agencies and indeed federal agencies like the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, who have been um, very, very important in terms of uh, reclaiming and re-energising certain sites in Sydney. This slide as well also shows you a couple of major sites, um, port sites, Orangaroo, the Lord Mayor talked about, it's a 22 hectare site in Sydney. I'm not going to go into that at the moment, it's in a planning stage. Again, maybe um, in four or five years, uh, you'll be inundated with talks about Orangaroo in terms of the reconstructed headland and its, its parkland. The other one down through here is, is a larger site, it's an 80 hectare, uh, sort of part of the working harbour of Sydney, the Bays Precinct, and that's soon to be um, master plan essentially, and this, this will be a new mixed-use community, waterfront parks, ideally connected by uh, light rail and transport, but again, uh, it's very early days and, and hard to know how that will work. Just a quick, hopefully you can see some of this, but as part of some of the work we did, we've, we've gone along the 14K um, journey and, and documented it photographically, just to have a look at what the interfaces are, what are the water edge conditions? And you'll find a lot of these, some, some, in some cases they actually beautifully step down and use the local material sandstone and engage with the water. But I think the vast majority of spaces, in particular the, the great cultural ones around the Opera House and Circular Quay, Botanic Gardens, they actually separate people from the water. And you know, often we have a three metre drop from promenade down to the water's edge. And it's, a, it's, it's not fantastic in terms of a harbour city which uh, puts its whole identity and its relationship to the harbour and yet in very few cases can you actually get down to the water and engage with it. I think this is one of the fundamental things that the suite of new projects in Sydney have began to uh, readdress. Um, I'm going to start here with another colleague's work. This is uh, from an office called JMD, James Mather Design. 
I'm showing some ALA award-winning projects um, which are part of this new suite of um, waterfront projects. This one here is called um, the Glebe Foreshore Walk. And one of the things I love about it is not only it's beautifully designed, uh, it's about circulation, but it's also about placemaking on the water and enabling people to get down to the water in a range <coughs> of spaces. It also has recreated a kind of a harbour front ecology by trying to re-establish mangroves uh, in what is a um, you know quite a built-up area, which is um, no mean feat. Um, beautifully designed sort of moments, and I think some of these, as you can start to see here. Um, get down to the water and enable activities, water waterbound activities and reclaim beaches. Um, some of the images that Jerry was showing previously uh, are kind of using waterfront engineering, maritime engineering in a similar way. The next Cockatoo Island, and this is a uh, project under the curation of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust, which is a federal agency tasked with um, renewing some of our um, defence sites and post-industrial sites in Sydney. Cockatoo Island is a kind of a utopian landscape. It sits um, near to Balmain as a peninsula and it has um, these two incredible dry docks, with formerly used um, dry docks, now flooded. Um, but the scale of this place is, is quite sublime. It's essentially it's a sandstone knoll which sits um, in the middle of a skirt of reclaimed land and it has recently been turned into a, 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 a harbour park, essentially, where our, um, our art biennial takes place and also other kind of more unique um, opportunities have been recently instilled. You can actually go and camp on Cockatoo Island in the middle of Sydney Harbour and it's, um, it's an incredibly sublime uh, place to be. Dallas Point Park is, um, is one of the sort of uh, hero projects, I suppose, of, of Sydney in terms of the moment, it's a, it's a reclaimed industrial site by McGregor Coxall and a master plan done by Context and Cab, JND and others. Um, it's a, quite an incredible, robust and um, willful project that sort of recreates a sandstone headland. Um, it's in a very, uh, I suppose it's one, one thing that it, it um, limits its usability and also is a beautiful thing about the park is it's not, it's not well connected to the harbour foreshore walk. It's actually the extension of um, quite a fine grain residential area, but it has a very strong presence uh, on the harbour with these sort of large bluffs and steps down to the water. Um, moments of sort of heritage interpretation and, and hints at what the future could be in terms of moving from oil and petrol to other more sustainable types of energy production. This one here showing the wind generation. But it's a very beautiful scheme, very deft um, moves in this one. Okay, I'll start to talk about one of our projects. Um, this, is, <clears throat> this is a project called Pyramid Park in Piermont in Sydney. Uh, it's a two hectare post-industrial site. Um, and essentially it began life I'll just show you the location of it. Again, Barangaroo sitting here, um, Sydney Harbour, Circular Quay down through here, and this is Piermont down through here. What you see is a very strong ridge road that comes down to the water, and this is Harris Street, and our site lands here. Um, I use this slide to indicate that Sydney obviously has a pretty thriving um, ferry transport, but it, it really doesn't, um, doesn't live up to what it could be. There's a lot of opportunity there to reconnect um, the, the sort of the waterside landscape of Sydney by maybe other ferry crafts and boat. Um, this slide here just talks about the, the high street connections and many of you who um, know Sydney will realise that there's a series of sandstone geology creates a series of ridge tops uh, originally used as uh, indigenous walking tracks um, and then of course um, now our high streets. The one that uh, ends our side is Harris Street and this has a range of civic and cultural buildings along its edge. Um, Pyramid Park is the thing that terminates it down at the water. Um, what was it previously? Well, it's been a range of things over time. It's been a munition store, it's been timber yards, it's been CSR, sugar refinery depot. Essentially, it's a sandstone headland that, again, has a sheer drop down to a skirt, a recreated skirt around here. This is an existing park. Part of our brief was to connect to and create an open space of about four hectares on the water. The most interesting thing for us as designers, I think, uh, in approaching this was one, the, the collaborative process that we set up on the design side. We worked with 
Um, another landscape architect, Craig Burton, uh, architect Hill Thallis. Um, and we as landscape architects led this process. It's a high profile project for the city of Sydney. It's a $26 million park. Um, most of that budget sits underneath the, the ground in a lot of the water interface and the engineering. Um, and I think, what, you know, how did we approach it? Well, it became a project for the City of Sydney, I might just go back to this, through community um, engagement and community protest. Essentially, this area down through here has become quite a high density residential community. And it was planned to have three more towers on this site down through here. The community really staged a very impressive action and, you know, on-site protests and the like. And one of the residents who then, who after this protest, became the Deputy Lord Mayor, Marcel Hoff, was um, president of a group called Friends of Piermont. And they lobbied this, the uh, local government to actually buy this land from the state government, which they did for $10 million, and, um, and bequeathed it as a park to the people. And that, as a foundation for us as designers, was a, a very powerful um, foundation. So community engagement was a huge thing on this project, and we did over 40 hours and four different stages of community engagement to get to a point uh, that the community felt real ownership over it. So to look at the history, again, this sort of bluff that was originally there, pre-colonial time, and you can see the sort of outline of the, um, the reclaimed land down through here, uh, which over time, through its manifestations of industry uh, and working harbour, became this very important platform that then came up with that Ridge Street up Harris Street and uh, fed the city, whether it was sugar or timber. What we inherited was a site like this. At first instance, not a lot of character. Um, for those designers in the room, maybe there's a great sense of terrain vague, something beautiful in the post-industrial landscape here. But essentially, it's a flat cap of reclaimed land. And uh, everything from this line here, this same one metre level change, out through here is over water, reclaimed, and everything from here is terra firma. Um, uh, so it's a kind of a before and after shot, obviously, um, but I'll take you through some of the process. I think one of the, the key things for us in terms of trying to get into the site and the design was to set principles up front. And to go to the community where the design was not right straight away, we decided to um, enshrine or see if we could get agreement on seven principles. And they seem very um, sensible and high level. I guess the key ones for us in terms of making a, a place on the waterfront was about connectivity um, and in principle engaging with the water, enabling people to get down to the water and use it as their playground. There are others about views and vistas, but the, the other key one I think is really connections and this becomes apparent in all waterfront projects. If you can't get there, um, it has um, you know, a far less chance of being a successful place. We went to the community with three options. I've since learned not to put your favourite option as option one, but um, <laughs> thankfully this one got through. And this was really about, uh, it was called Shorelines, and essentially it was about recreating this um, bay that was there formerly. And um, you know, this one hinted at a kind of a, um, a beautiful sandy beach down through here, and really willfully separating the reclaimed land from the terra firma. And um, the others were about creating waterfront rooms and play spaces on the water. The community um, got great momentum to the first scheme, um, which was probably the more radical of all of the schemes. And so what you can see here is the master plan that um, showed this sort of sheltered bay, if you like, which is a, a very contained and calm space that steps down to the water from the high ground down. This part here, which is called the green, which is a very flat and tectonic grassland, unprogrammed space. The grove, which has you know, several hundred local trees and shrubs planted in here for um, ecology and biodiversity. And there's a playground which sits at the south down through here. So we conceived of it as a series of different rooms, all designed with one hand, but um, a series of different experiences, whether it's on the water, in the park, or within the play. Um, just a slide to give you more an idea of the kind of um, density that sits around this. So this becomes a front yard, backyard for a pretty vibrant community down through here who otherwise are perhaps a bit starved of space land side. The park as it is um, on sort of day one, and again, no people in here, but I think you can see that the key moves being um, this line here was the line that I talked about in the previous shot the line that we inherited, the one metre high wall, 
and we've used that as a device to create a, a foreshore promenade down through here, which in some of the shots that you'll see recreate or um, give an abstract understanding of how the water might have once met the edge of the land along here. All of the heritage and the marine sort of, or the, the maritime archaeology, we talked about it, we wanted to expose and show very clearly the new insertions through the old, just so that you can have a look at the kind of scale of the piers um, and the like. This is a, a sort of ground level view of the sheltered bay and how it steps down and how registering tides has become a very important thing for us. So when you go there, you'll actually see the site in very different modes at high tide to low tide. It exposes a range of different experiences. This is very high tide here and you can walk out onto this platform. The water play um, was an incredibly important part of this as well. There's a fabled story of a Piermont Spring, and part of the design was to recreate that in a, in a playground experience down through here. Um, shade is used, is created through trees primarily, and procurement of large trees was a very imp important part of it as well. We worked with a landscape architect um, colleague, Fiona Robay, in the play space design um, here. A lot of this sandstone that you see forming the framework of the playground is reclaimed from uh, the old Piermont Bridge. So it has a nice history coming back to the site. This is the foreshore promenade and um, a lot of this stuff was quite controversial. We're using, um, you know, not unstabilized gravel down through here and a lot of plants with no edges. They're free to be, um, you know, making their own ground down through here. People wear away the gaps between them and the stairs and walls shift uh, like this foreshore landscape and sandstone might have done um, in a previous time. The shore sheds, these are quite beautifully designed um, series of canopies that Hill Palace uh, looked after with solar panels on their roof which power the park lights. And the, the main uh, entry into the park is framed by this uh, lofty roof which is essentially a belvedere, publicly accessible 24-7. You can walk onto it and look down into the park. Um, the levels of this park uh, are that you sit high and drop down about four to five metres. And this roof, which almost looks like the kind of, uh, has some sort of boat naval architecture um, as it's generated, um, frames the, the entry as a civic building might to an important place. Okay, the next project is a a very different scale and a very different typology. It's um, Darling Quarter in <coughs> Darling Harbour in Sydney. And the figures that we have is that this is one of the most visited places in Australia, 22 million people through here each year. Uh, I'm not sure how they calculate it. I think they count people coming and going from work as well. Um, but the project itself is, um, <coughs> is a very interesting one. This is again the, the, the Harbour Foreshore Walk and Darling Harbour down through here. And this is Darling Quarter in the red down in this area. So it's just off the edge of the water down through here. And it's a, it's a renewal of Darling Harbour South. And previously, it was a very disconnected site. It had a large uh, box, Cedar World, which turned its back on the city. And um, essentially, this becomes the western face of our CBD down through here, this line, Harbour Street. Darling Harbour is like a valley floor, um, Ridge One which is Piermont and, and uh, Harris Street, we were just talking about. Ridge 2 is really the city and George Street Spine. And in the middle of that, draining down, is Darling Harbour. Um, I'll just talk quickly about this because it's an area in absolute transition. Uh, there's a the latest and greatest project in Darling Harbour is Psych Heap Site, which is a 20 hectare transformation of Darling Harbour. It will be a new convention and exhibition um, building, plus a I suppose a regeneration of the southern side of Darling Harbour. This, this uh, the, sorry, the western side. The project we're talking about sits here on the eastern side, and it was a competitive bid. It's a um, project that was delivered by Lend Lease with state government partnership, Sydney Harbour Foreshore Authority. It's their land, and it's on a 99-year lease. Essentially, what it is is two buildings here, which are headquarters of Commonwealth Bank, and they were tenanted from day one. So the fact that the project had a tenant uh, from day one allowed the owners, allowed Lend Lease to be a little bit more confident about what they might do in the public realm. And what they did was take a real um, risk in the competition and say, we're going to develop a zone of influence around this. It's not just about delivering these buildings, but it's about revitalising Darling Harbour, a place 
It hadn't really been regenerated since 1988, uh, only in small parts. The strategy was to uh, recreate, there was a, an existing smaller play space on this site, but what the brief to us was, was to create a kind of a world's best destination or play space in here. And we took that on and, um, and really created it as part of an, an overall public realm um, strategy rather than just a play space by itself. The key things were about creating new connections back to the city um, through this new connection, Civic Connector as we call it, which meets up with Town Hall Station up through here. And the creation of a pedestrian promenade and a retail promenade, grass areas, and then the play space itself, which I'll talk to. But the, the key thing which, um, which we tried to establish was these connectivity lines back down to Darling Harbour itself. And this is the overall context shot of it. Uh, the buildings you can see down through here, they're, they're kind of landscaper buildings. They're about six to eight storeys high. And in fact, it's actually four buildings. There's an atrium in the middle, park buildings down through here, and city buildings on this side. Civic connectors strongly coming into Tumbalong Park, and then the public realm upgrades down through here, which connects back to the city and to the harbour. The play space itself, um, we... We, was really the focus for us. It's the centerpiece of the project and it's been designed to cater for a range of different age groups and uses. Um, really, the, you'll see in the plan that the, the younger babies and toddlers are around this area where it connects back to retail and this sort of terrace. And then beyond that, where um, older kids are more willing to go further away from parents is the more adventurous play elements. One of the things that we're trying to do is to open up this mid canopy of the valley floor of Darling Harbour to allow for views and connectivity through. And the other is that we created, again, we look back at the history of the site, and as mentioned before, this being in the valley floor has was a series of tributaries down from the ridges, and the water play elements that um, we have designed for this are a direct reflection and tr sort of translation of the site history. There was a water called Mill on the site, a whole lot of um, beautiful sort of stainless steel machinery. And that gave us the impetus to actually look to uh, embed in a, in a landscape of streams and rivulets a series of elements, um, stainless steel elements, which uh, we sourced from Germany actually and brought back to the project and cited them in this landscape. Um, and it's an interactive play space for kids, which really, by its design, incentivizes kids to socialize together. You have to work together to make this playground work. Uh, how it works broadly is there's four, there's a source of water up here through a pumping station and there's four streams. There's a series of locks and gates that kids have to actually team up with to move the water down various streams. And without even knowing it, they are incentivized to actually socialize and interact. And it's, uh, it's fantastic. It's one of the busiest uh, projects that we've worked on and it's been a, a success in, for us in terms of that. The other elements to it, um, which make it, I think, more of a complete project for us are um, these types of things, which is the telling of site history through the ground plane and interpretation, uh, and also placemaking uh, place initiatives which we put into place here and have been taken on by uh, the state government. Things like bringing out rugs, putting out deck chairs, having music day to day. Um, these things are all free and they're all part of the, the overall governance of the project. I mean, that was very quick. All right, I'll, uh, I'm going to be skipping through a few projects, I think. Uh, um, some of the other more bespoke elements are things like this that we've designed for the project. Very robust, precast table tennis, and again, free but highly important element to the creation of public space, I think, in uh, whether it's waterfront or not, um, the curation and, and ongoing planning and programming. The other thing that the architecture does is work extremely well at night. Um, this is an interactive light wall uh, facade to the building which you can use your iPad or use terminals to actually program the, uh, the pixels of light through here which has been a, a huge success as you would imagine. A very, very small project, one that I can go quickly through, but again one that um, was probably seminal for us as an office. Um, this is a Sydney Harbour Federation Trust piece of land. It's in a place called Watson's Bay, which is in south head of Sydney. It's in, in a, in a harbour site. Um, the site itself was an old house uh, lot, and it was basically fenced off 
Um, no public use uh, able to be used down through here. Sydney Harbour Federation Trust got a hold of it and again made it a park. And it's a very, very simple thing that we've done is to create a landing point here and a, an edge condition here at the, uh, at the water and a path that mimics the old water line through the site. And I'll just take you through it. It's very hard to see this one. Um, again, a very touch the ground lightly project. Only three real moves. This one here has become a kind of an outdoor lounge room for the locals down through here who just, in all through the year, use this as the place where they, um, you know, dis disrobe, hang out, um, and just have conversations. It's a, it's a very, very simple gesture. Three large precast steps um, that provide access in a lounge to the water edge. One of the details of the paving uh, when you get down to it, I suppose, is picks up on what Jerry was talking about, whether we're dealing with a, a master plan or a kind of a, a one to one to one scale and a view back. Part of the identity of Sydney is the coastline, the Pacific Edge. This is the um, Bondi to Bronte Coast Walk and it's an incredibly powerful landscape down through here. Um, again, our approach to this project was one of respect. It's not about what we were doing, it was about um, creating the ability for people to access the edge of the Pacific Ocean and the sandstone cliffs and also come pretty close to this incredible cultural um, and, and living place, the, um, the uh, cemetery. So this is the context of it, Bondi Beach, we're down through here, cemetery is here, um, Bronte Beach and then Coogee Beach down through here. It's about nine metres in elevation from one side to the other. And it's an incredibly sensitive site with some remnant bushland down through here and a lot of uh, community participation. I guess our strategy for these projects is again to um, very much look at the site for the queues to construction. And this one touches the ground very, very lightly. You can see the elevation from the top to the bottom. And again, it's a path, but it just uses the crystalline geometry of sandstone to create a series of little lookouts and uh, opportunities for prospect either north or south. You'll see that in a few of these views. It's probably one of the, um, the most used exercise routes uh, along the coast. It goes all the way to Bondi and it leads on to the sculpture by the sea as well, further into Bronte. We start to have a look at our strategy, which was to um, create these almost sublime cliff top lookouts, a um, series of lounges. And again, just some shots of the detailing of users. How am I going to time? Two more minutes. Two more minutes. <laughs> I might do. I'm just going to fly through this one and, and end on one project, and you can just have a look at the images here without much explanation. It's a lagoon. We've used some beautiful timber. We've sighted them um, in particular locations, and I think what I like about this project is the actual simplicity of it but the detailing using timber piles that were uh, a remnant from site and taking that idea and actually making some kind of playful landscape and structural elements out of it. This is a pedestrian and cycle uh, walk in northern beaches of Sydney. The last project is called Jack Evans Boat Harbour. This is not in Sydney. This is on the border of New South Wales and Queensland and why this is a very interesting project for our office was that it Council's um, brief really for this one was to look at this project as a way of uplifting both the social and economic well-being uh, of this area, which is pretty run down. Previously, it's a, uh, it was the river, the Great Tweed River used to come through here. This area was all reclaimed, and what we're dealing with here was this boat harbour, which is where most people in this area learn to swim. It's a very calm and, uh, and, and passive uh, water resource. This side is where all the fantastic surf beaches are, so this is highly protected. The master plan really is a spine, and off the spine a range of grooves and access to the, uh, the water become possible. This is what it was when we inherited it. Um, you know, one, one guy who was um, just put his boats out daily, the, the sort of really highly eroded banks which are completely inhumane. Um, and haven't been working in terms of their erosion control for many, many years. Um, and the opportunity that we saw was to work with the natural processes of the water and to create a series of different edge conditions, whether it was beach, 
or steps or platforms uh, that people could interact with along that spine. What we did was use um, 3D modeling to actually map low tide, high tide uh, mid tide and high tide to have a look at what the, uh, the tidal variances would do both to the newly created beaches but also to the harbour pool that we were creating. And these are some of the images. The platforms, which again register the change in tide down through here, which is a very beautiful layering onto the project. And on the other side, this sort of rock revetment, which again creates a series of harbour pools down through here, which are protected. Um, depending on what the tide is doing, it contains water. We also designed this to be all abilities so that anyone, prams, ramps, etc., can get down. The beach platforms really being respectful of the existing vegetation around through here, the banks here in Tegra Folias, um, which create a fantastic scale. Um, and again, finally, I think I'll just leave you on this one, which illustrates really what we were trying to do with the design concept, which was to create these series of shifting planes along the water edge and create different experiences as you step down. Apologies for rushing, but uh, I'll hand over to Tony. Thank you. Sasha, um, as, as I said in the introduction, I think the work of the two gentlemen today speaks to the excitement about the potential for our own uh, our own harbor. And as I mentioned, I, Tony used I'm sorry, Sasha used a couple words there that I thought were really nice. That he said, it, "Willful and thoughtful." It's, it is about expressing ourselves and having a belief that we can make positive change. I think sometimes in Ted May we're held back by the fact that we don't believe in change. And we have a community that sometimes throws out and says nothing, you know, that these things can't happen. So it is willful and thoughtful, but when it originates and grows out of the place, as Sasha's projects have, an understanding of place and a respect for those underlying qualities, then I think we, that's where positive and, and uh, good change comes from. Uh, the next speaker is Tony McCormick. He continues on in the tradition of Tony's in the City Talk Speaks. He's the third Tony to speak uh, to us. Tony is the principal of uh, Hassel, which is a, it's a large landscape architecture firm, one of Australia's leading dis interdisciplinary firms. Uh, he's been working in the discipline for 30 years and 20 years in, in the waterfront. Again, like Sasha, he's won numerous, his firm's won numerous awards. And I would say again, in, in, in looking at Hassel's work over the years, understanding the kind of company they are, they're a big firm, it, it, you know, big numbers of people, and I think. But what I really like is I don't get that feeling from the work. I feel like when I look at Hassel's work, I'm looking at the work of a small practice and the kind of uh, intuition and energy that, that a youthful organ, the youth in an organization can bring to the project to help us old guys out with the, with the gray beard. So, Tony, I'd like to turn it over to you and let you talk about uh, Hassel's work and your own experiences in Waterfront. Thank you. Same position with this waterfront here. So, my talk um, 
put some guy into the sort of detail of some of the issues of work that uh, Sasha presented. But I'm trying to put it in the context of where Hobart is now on the basis of our experience of waterfront design. Um, let's see if the technology works. Okay, what I'll do is overview some of the recent examples and drivers to the waterfront development some elements of success that we've determined based on our experience. I'll be brave and talk about some of the attributes of your waterfront. One thing I've learned in China, working up there many times, is that you don't go there and tell them what the great people from other places think. But I'll risk it. <laughs> I've a case study of our work at uh, Darwin Waterfront. And, um, uh, I haven't been there for a while, but uh, Greg Millen has, so he can tell you a bit more about it. Um, but it has run uh, parallels to where, where you are here now in terms of scale and size of the economy and population, etc. And then I'll just overview some of our waterfront experience, which should give you an idea of the scales we work out as landscape architects in a multidisciplinary practice and show you um, how the our ideas are being formulated on the basis of that sort of experience. Now, these waterfronts um, traditionally occupy the area between the city and the water, um, where they've been places for trade and industry. Um, very often these, these days, the century have become blighted spaces as the industry declines, but they provide a great opportunity to repopulate the areas, reimagine them, re uh, come up with a whole new range of programs and developments um, that suit the modern population and capitalize on some of the heritage of the particular places. So post-war, um, there's many opportunities to redevelop these redundant uh, landscapes and um, capitalise on the fact that the industry is not there through changes in technology or economics and increasing land values as um, the adjacency of these lands to the urban uh, centres becomes more obvious. It's been a worldwide phenomenon post-war. Everybody's doing it, particularly in Western uh, countries and now in developing countries. You will know some of the current examples which I've mentioned here. Um, and some of them are mind-bogglingly huge. Um, Kai-Tak Airport development in Hong Kong, along with the West Calhoun uh, Cultural Park, the Singapore Marina Bay Sands and Gardens by the Bay. Um, in Sydney, um, Sasha's talked about Barangaroo briefly, Darling Harbour and Walsh Bay, Melbourne Docklands, um, Brisbane South Bank was one of the original uh, waterfront redevelopments, and now it's going through another iteration. Um, smaller parks in Brisbane, such as uh, Rocks Riverside Park, um, the waterfront developments and Waterbank. And then there's this series of um, smaller capital cities and regional cities which may have parallels for um, your situation, being Port Adelaide, Darwin, Auckland, Wellington, and Cairns Waterfront, and obviously Geelong, which is just across the waterway, really. Mind boggling, we're talking about multi-billion dollar projects in some of these areas. This is uh, Marina Bay Sands, Gardens by the Bay, it's a um, cultural sister if you like. Kowloon um, uh, Cultural Park. Um, and we've got uh, Dubai on the Swan, a rather <laughs> ambitious addition to uh, uh, the city council and the government. Um, I hasten to say that all these projects have had a, a major role, or the landscape market is playing a major role in the South Bank, Geelong, which has been the catalyst for a city that was on its knees economically, Cairns, the one which through a whole variety of reasons was also on its knees, and now exporting one as a centre of significant tourism and economic activity. And these smaller cities such as uh, Wellington and Auckland. But what makes these waterfronts special? Well, iconic waterfronts by imagination. People want to be involved, they want to see 
how we can willfully adapt, change, see water parts into um, machines or areas if you like that we currently made well. They become the postcards or images of cities. Um, they are catalysts for major urban renewal and reinvention in cities. The waterfronts, it's amazing what happens in the plan. I mean, I often wonder if Mona had been sited down here rather than where it is now, um, what it could have been as a catalyst for this part of the city. Now, they're all different, those ones that I showed you in terms of scale. Um, and their difference is part of their success. But they also have some common uh, elements of success, and I'd, I'd just like to um, review that. And these elements are in planning and design terms, The first thing is that all successful water front developments capitalize on a sense of place, on the special or unique qualities of their setting, be they cultural or natural or ecological factors, scenic factors, in the case of um, um, Sydney, and they can be elements of the particular societies that they want to project um, their culture through their waterfront. The sense of place also gives a strong identity and branding. It's a sellable commodity. Um, they're recognised by those particular individual attributes that make it uh, special. Yeah, the, sub, the, the individual parts that make it the sum. And they're usually examples of planning and design excellence and the activities of multidisciplinary teams. There's very few waterfronts in the career developments of the planet. I can't think of any actually you go and say, well, it just, it just happened. Um, they all showcase particular design uh, skills of their community. The economic and cultural viability of water, successful waterfronts is obvious. Um, they've always got a strong commercial basis. They create jobs, they attract people, uh, they improve the land values. There's usually a diverse mix of land uses for the purposes of giving economic resilience and providing interest to visitors. There's a focus on the great things that can happen in these spaces. These spaces become places in which people or communities celebrate, where they have major events. Um, and they're obviously catalysts for economic and cultural activity. And that means that they not only have involved physical change and development, but a whole program of activity. And that's why you see many of these developments um, being governed by or administered by um, waterfront corporations or development authorities. They do development as well as the program, the stage, and the activities of mine. Increasingly, the examples of sustainability, um, none more so than um, what's happening in, in uh, Singapore, the ABC Waters Project, where all of the runoff from the whole island, that's stormwater runoff, is being harnessed by this barrage in this case here, recycled, and then used throughout the city. Um, in terms of other aspects of sustainability, there's cultural factors, they had strong arts programs, education, creative industries, etc. The urban infrastructure, um, they all focus on uh, good public transport and often get uh, sustainable energy use. And obviously, through land use diversity, they get uh, commercial resilience. The last element of success is the role of government. And Lord Mayor touched on this. I was very interested to hear him talking about all these little opportunities. What makes these projects successful is the strong role of government in their uh, preparing the vision, um, basing that on consultation, and providing guidance over the decades which will, um, is required to provide transition to the waterfront developments. They have to galvanise interest and get buy in. The government also is the catalyst for the key developments. And and these might be iconic architectural developments. They could be the keystone projects from a commercial point of view. And they could be the hard things that developers just don't want to handle. They need to be integrators. And um, particularly for the place between the developments, the glue that binds it all together. And 
listening to the Lord Mayor, I was uh, uh, happy to hear of so many opportunities, but I was wondering, so what's the vision for all this? Is just everybody doing their own thing? Or are you looking at it from a total waterfront package that can be a marketable thing and, and provide greater, great uh, returns to the community across a wide variety of areas? Obviously, government needs to actively promote public and private partnerships to get things done. They need to leave and promulgate mixed uses, um, particularly in relation to providing living, working, education, and cultural environments. And they need to be aware and provide leadership in this change process that it doesn't just cost things, or else um, just hanging up a fan or whatever. And you can see that in many waterfronts, particularly during the 80s. Um, these spaces will just be uh, an international homogenization of stuff, and they won't be special. So that's a leadership role that government must take on for itself. This is where I'm brave. Um, last time I was down here, I was showing this model, and um, I thought, wow, there's a lot of space there through, technology, through technological change. No longer requires the way uh, things are done anymore. So I thought change brings uh, opportunity, industrial change, and these large spaces were right for potential development, rebirth. The working harbour and, and the settings provide a very special character. Many of the um, projects that uh, Jerry showed and, and I will show have lost their working harbour. And uh, I think that's uh, a sad thing. Uh, certainly, Sydney's lost it in most places. Uh, you have it here, it's something to be treasured and to capitalise on. Um, Jerry Shea is a very important the scale of the buildings across the way and the other buildings around this particular basin is very important and provides an obvious framework for further development. Um, some international recognition is really good, and uh, while I've got this, this particular picture, this city is the centre for um, Polar Gateway to the Antarctic, and um, it has already the ability to bring interest internationally. The area is also a focus of tourism and community uses, so the community is interested in this and uses on a day to day basis. And the other thing is that this particular Sullivan's Cove area and downtown area must be seen in the context of the overall waterfronts of Hobart. You don't need to duplicate a lot of things without being undertaken elsewhere. But to capitalise on the special nature of this area. So that's me being brave. This particular section of the presentation is on the Darwin waterfront, and you may see parallels between your situation and this project was led by uh, our company's former chairman, Ken Ma, who's a landscape architect and an architect. And uh, it was about transforming a previously contaminated industrial site into a public landscape to provide a new waterfront address to the city of Darwin. Now, by way of context, Darwin is on the coast, but it's not a water city. The reason for that is, five months of the year, people can't even go near the water because of the stigma, notwithstanding the fact there's crocodiles in the rest of you. <laughs> so I haven't really engaged with the um, waterfront areas at all. Um, just some project headlines, if you like. The project was initiated by the Northern Territory Government and through a public private partnership tendering process. They, um, went to partnership with ABN and AMRO, and they had a team of other people like Tova, who were also investors in developing the project. The key thing about this project is, and any waterfront project, is momentum. And um, we started involved in about 2004 on this. Stage one was completed in about 2009-10, and they're starting the stage two now. You have to maintain the momentum, or else you're just creating projects that are half finished and the opportunity for further derivation. Uh, it involved in our organisation um, a team led by landscape architects and urban designers, planners and architects obviously. Stage one site is 25 hectares over a 
total of about 120, it's received considerable recognition, both locally and internationally. So this is what it looked like. Uh, you can see how much engagement the city here had with the water, virtually none. Um, it was separated both vertically, by 15 metre escarpment, which is highly vegetated, um, and the lack of any physical connections. Uh, you can see some of the naval uses here, but largely it was being sorted up, remnants of some of the post the, the former industrial activities are still there. Gives you an idea of some of the things in um, detail, space in detail. The only group, people, time people went down there was to hop on a cruise ship, it was a go through space. Um, it was derelict, it was anti anti group. So our job was to come up with a mixed-use plan that was capable of delivering the stages. Stage one was to include the catalytic bits, the hard bits, if you like, the bits that the government would do to sow the seeds and get um, buy-in by the public sector. So that included a lot of these public things such as recreational facilities, swimming beach versus type in that area, various parklands, um, retail opportunities, a couple of hotels, importantly a convention centre, ICOM, um, commercial uh, office space, and a variety of other programmatic oriented or culturally oriented activities such as a public art program, um, a heritage interpretation program, etc. So we were working both on the physical level and the programmatic level. This is stage one you see in the green bit of design. Uh, it's been complete, as I said, and they're starting to work on the other stages now. So the challenge to us, and it came by the Chief Minister's personal engagement in this project, was Claire Martin at the time. She said, I want a world-class development. It doesn't want world-class development, but it had to be mixed juice. It had to be integrated, not only with itself, but the city. She had a thing in her mind that they wanted be, she wanted to have an exemplar development for equatorial cities. Now, this is important. If you think of cities around the equator, they're all pretty derelict. They're some of the worst places on the planet. And Darwin, some would say, was the arse end of Australia and Asia. Um, it had very little going for it at this point in terms of the destination. It was always seen as a gateway to somewhere else. So she wanted to make it an example for other cities in the equatorial area. It had to be a place of welcome, and not only to the citizens, but to tourists, and it had to capture Darwin's unique identity. So I want to focus on unique identities because that's the secret of successful water plants. I'll zip through this. But uh, Darwin's cultural diversity was something that they were all very proud of, both Western and indigenous cultural diversity, the lush landscapes of the tropics, the tropical savanna climate, which is both benign, but it could be horrible on other occasions, so there were challenges there, both in terms of you know, user comfort levels, buildings, energy use, and things like that. Casual living, that can want to be a stuffy northern hemisphere, um, um, well-established uh, urban environment. Wanted to have an active harbour, what was left of it, because there were very few activities left on the harbour. They saw themselves, it sort of looked like this area, an area of vibrant markets and activity. And of course, the heritage aspects of the site and its um, uh, context. So, some of the key moves that we um, worked through on this project were the uh, connection to the city. Um, the heart of the development to be the beach, the convention <coughs> centre focus, the fact that we want to make an accessible harbour. These have to be democratic spaces. All waterfronts should be democratic spaces. And all localities. The biggest challenge was one of the biggest physical challenges was one of city connection. And um, uh, Greg actually reminded me of the, the success of um, the solution we came up with connected this big um, waterfront to the city, which is taking the level of uh, Smith Street Mall, 
bringing it through a, a sky bridge to the site. So the design builds upon um, the strong heritage values of the site and um, extends the street pattern of the city, bringing it to the water's edge. A little bit like fingers poking out into the waterway. And this became a clue for us to manipulate the buildings and the spaces and the connectors. Um, you see on this diagram how we celebrated the ridge in terms of the scale and the little buildings below it. We overcome its barrier effects. We capitalised on its enclosure elements. And then we utilised um, the geometry of the city into the development itself. Gave a clue for how we manipulated the architectural components. The beachfront part is really important to this. It's, as I said before, these places become centres of, of great celebration for the host community. This whole idea of being able to provide a year round swimming environment for citizens was overwhelming. Why can't we swim? So this became one of the things we had to deliver, and the way we chose to do that was to have a, a wave pool and a small boat harbour. And obviously the, the landscape, parklands uh, surrounding it. So this gives you a feeling for, these are a bit old now, but a feeling for um, some of the um, spaces, the wave pool, the tropical lushness, Casual lifestyle being replicated and accommodated within the uh, development. You can see the residential development <coughs> behind. Um, one comment on residential development um, one of the, the sad things about Brain Rue, which both Sasha and themselves are working on, is, in my opinion, there is insufficient residential around there, but you can't have too much residential so that most people try to annex and make private those public spaces, so accommodation. The balance is important. The area is well used both day and night. Uh, this pro uh, photo is important in that it shows some of the key elements and uh, might give a clue to some of the opportunities here. This is the convention centre, which is obviously an iconic and huge element within so broad well. I'll talk about that at the moment. The wave pool, these are the hotels. That's a car park. Can you imagine just taking all the cars out of here, redeveloping that space and having people uh, in active uh, program spaces to make a huge difference. And this is the associated park. And these have been designed, they're wired for everything. Um, it's up to the entrepreneurs to come up with the ideas that through the um, Garland um, Water Pro Authority to how it might be used. And um, Greg mentioned that he was there at the end of the festival and it really rocked, so that was good thing. You see an idea of this, some of the idea of settings with the, um, the hotels in the background, the city behind, the night use. Um, the next um, key move was dealing with the convention centre now. Um, Convention centres are buildings which have fronts and backs, and um, this one uh, had the front of the um, uh, development area and the good presence. It also had to be serviced, and the way we fitted it into the site uh, overcame some of, some of the issues of having the back of the house. Um, it's obvious in the, in the landscape, you can't hide it. We chose to come up with an architectural form that replicated the um, Muscles, green elements of the site. Uh, contextually, uh, it had to be part of the overall development. It looks a bit stark there, but the, the trees grow up and some of the people are uh, um, one with the development. The building itself is quite tricky um, in terms of the way it handles energy. Basically, it's the glass curtain which develops a drum, where all the activities happen. It will circulate between the glass curtain and the drum, and that's where we manipulate the uh, air temperature, um, couple of levels, etc. And the building itself, as 
for example, with uh, the session that you showed in his part of the program here, yeah, 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 yeah. well, I think it changes all the time. It's not quite as interactive as what one in Darling Harbour is. And it's also a setting that's own right for a variety of uh, sculptures. The accessible harbour is extremely important, not only for the city, but also for other parts of that wider waterfront area. You may always mention that part of the, the, the central area here, but also understand it in the context of the, the wider connected democratic waterfront. So fundamental to making this work was connecting it to the city, and we did this through this uh, sky bridge, which runs directly off Smith Street. It provides bridges and lifts and stairs to get down to the site. But what it does do most importantly is provide the first prospect of this, this uh, waterfront. So it automatically captures the people and gets them in the mood to enjoy this special place. And the idea also is to provide shade all the way down to the area um, for obvious reasons in the tropical environment. But this is the prospect you get if you come in to develop. And lastly, there were four locations. Um, stage, and these roughly corresponded to the stages, and they roughly corresponded to the combination of land uses, which I won't go into in any detail. <laughs> so the first stage were those hard to do bits, catalytic bits, to galvanise and get interest in the development. Sustainability is a key move. I'm not going to go into it due to time, but we really focused on trying to use passive means to um, uh, provide comfort within the buildings and the spaces in between, manipulating the responding to a particular wind at different times of the year, changing the building locations or manipulating the building locations to, to create breezes. And lastly, an important component was capitalising on the heritage of the site and integrating it with the development. I mean, there's wonderful things here. There's, Oil tunnels are going underneath the cliffs. There's remnants of indigenous occupation. Uh, obviously, the war years are important too. And these are interpreted through a variety of uh, sculptures, different forms of artwork, um, interpretive program that backs it all up. And the way people of the area has promoted it, um, both as it is now and its heritage through the um, through the Water Trump Authority. So that's pretty well um, Darwin. Um, it's been a successful project for us and the city, and we're very proud of it. It was based on a lot of work that we do. We, we've done, I don't know, I started counting them up. You know, we've got over 80 projects, and they vary in scale from that sort of thing um, to small harbour parks by um, Sydney Harbour. Um, some of the ones you would know as by will be the Waterfront City Project, Belgium Docklands, the Dane Zed Bank headquarters, next door in Victoria Harbour, North Shore Hamilton, which is the project we've just finished, which is where the cruise line is coming in Brisbane, and it's associated uh, into land. Circular Key, Strategic Master Plan, we've just finished with the Governor Architect in Sydney. Uh, Water Bank in Western Australia, which is the major redevelopment of the lease uh, on the approach to the city. Um, some of the more interesting ones, uh, we designed a city, new city in China called Ningbo, which is actually a water city. That led to many other projects, one of which was this uh, Donkiang Lake, um, which is a, uh, a resort, but it's on floating islands, uh, which have a major water quality uh, impact. Taipo Park, um, this is famous because um, this is where your recent visit of Prince Charles handed over the colony to the Chinese, and so they needed a venue for it, so we designed this park for them. Um, Port Coogee, as opposed to Coogee. Um, Western Australia, which is a uh, mixed-use development being undertaken by Australand, where they're, they're project landscape architects. Some of the smaller projects, like Margate Foreshore, which um, redeveloped the whole waterfront of Red Cliff, um, a little bit like Glebe in uh, Sydney, Rocks Riverside Park on the left, which was an old uh, QCL Queensland cement site where they used to take the, take the coral from the reef, bring it to this site, crush it up, make cement out of it. Uh, 
and, and so it was a post-industrial park, Port Bay Park, next to one of those parks that, uh, that uh, Sasha showed at Bellas Point. It's apparently in Vila, the most uh, popular park for the citizens treaty of uh, Bellamay. So there's a whole variety of scales in there that have informed our thoughts on waterfronts. The key thing is that um, every community needs to identify what's special to it, capture what those elements that are special, have good governance that um, um, encourages public private partnerships and remembers the purpose by which we for which we develop redevelop waterfronts, which is provide to provide or longevity for the community to be cultural or economic development. So, I can't have a talk. Thank you, Tony. Thanks, Tony. Once again, really impressed that the beginning point is place, moving on to setting up clear principles for, for what should happen, and then getting out of the job of actually implementing things and seeing some exciting work. So thanks, Tony.